the beginning of this war was a disaster for the British. Uh, it was you know, the British continually got defeated by the French, and there's a number of reasons why. One of the reasons why is because the British wanted to fight this war like a, any European-style warfare. They wanted to basically have these long lines of men marching up towards other long lines of men and just brawling it out uh, by musket fire. The British are the best at doing this. The French, however, are not ever going to refuse to do this. They understand this is not how you fight a war against the British, particularly here in the New World. They're going to resort more to you know taking pot shots at the British Army and trying to wear them down, uh, you, uh, not only through the French Army units, but also through their Indian allies. So in 1754, the British come in, they fully expecting to go and basically brawl out in European design, style, and they find that that's not really going to work. In 1754, a general known as Edward Braddock is going to be sent with two regiments. They're sent to Virginia and ordered to take Fort Duquesne. Uh, basically, uh, they're you know trying to get to Fort Duquesne from Virginia. That's well, it's not like we got highways here. You have to make your own roads, and so they're going to be slowed down uh, because armies don't really march that quickly uh, for the most part, and they have to cut. They have to make their own routes, so they have to cut down trees. Well, of course, that's all going to attract attention of, of any uh, and neighboring uh, enemy force, either French or Indian. The result is that as Braddock is marching towards Fort Duquesne, his entire column is surrounded and wiped out by French and Indian allies. Braddock is killed and he's buried along the way. And in steps George Washington to basically take over the situation. He is able to uh, stabilize the situation for the British. And in fact, at the end of the battle, Washington is going to raise his hands uh, and he's going to notice that his uh, his coat is filled with bullet holes. So he's he's right in the thick of the battle. He's very you know he's very much shot at, uh, but miraculously he's never killed. Like I said, the French are going to try to employ a guerrilla style uh, tra uh, strategy against the redcoats, and they're and. And the uh, the British don't want to do that. They want to try to Europeanize this co conflict by restricting fire and may having great personal dif uh, discipline. Great meaning a lot uh, rather than good. Uh, the Virginia recruits are very uh, are few because this discipline really offends them. Uh, so at the beginning, the war is not looking good for the British. In 1756, a new French commander is going to arrive. Uh, his name is Louis-Joseph Marquis de Montcalm. He's one of the most famous uh, French generals to serve here in, in North America. And he's, he's, very, he's very successful. He's victorious at places like Fort Oswego, Fort William Henry. If you, you might have heard of Fort William Henry. That's the setting for Last of the Mohicans. But Brit so British efforts look like it's, do it's doomed. Uh, they, they are, you know, they're losing this war, but everything starts to turn around in 1758. If you take a look at a map, uh, particularly the entrance into the St. Lawrence River, uh, we would call it the St. Lawrence Seaway today, but nonetheless, if you look at the co entrance to the St. Lawrence River, there is a little city known as Louisburg, and there you can, you can, you can establish a naval base that, which that controls whatever comes in and what comes out of the, of the St. Lawrence River. Well, in 1758, that falls to the British, and now they have a base that they can stop the, Amer the, the French supply lines, uh, supplying all the French armies of arms and men, uh, and basically whittle down the French war effort. And what you see, therefore, if you look, if you look at our slide and if you look at a map, they basically just sail down the St. Lawrence River, taking out major French cities. For example, in 1759, Quebec falls into British hands. Uh, this is a costly bill, uh, victory for the British, as the uh, as their major commander, his name was James Wolfe, is going to be killed at this battle. So is the Marquis de Montcalm, the victor of Fort William Henry. He's also killed there as well. We've got some beautiful paintings of that. In 1760, Montreal falls, and therefore Canada is completely ceded to England. Desperate for an ally, France tries to get Spain involved, and Spain enters the war on the French side in 1762. The, the English basically say, oh yeah, okay, well, look at what we're going to do now. And they go, and they immediately capture Havana and Cuba and Manila and the Philippines. Um, and fr the French and the, and the Spanish are going to sue for peace. Uh, and, the, and they are going to meet in the diplomatic capital of the world. Uh, even today, the diplomatic language is French. Uh, if, you're, if you're a diplomat, you're, you, you should know how to speak French. Uh, and the capital of diplomacy for a very long time is Paris. So they meet 
in the Paris in 1763, thus giving what we call the Treaty of Paris of 1763. Now, you have to make sure, you know, I'm usually not a stickler with details when it comes to dates, you know, uh, but with treaties, you have to be very specific because one year off and you could be talking about a completely different treaty. For example, the Treaty of Paris of 1763 ends the French and Indian War, whereas the Treaty of 1783 ends the American Revolution. So if you mix those treaties together, you're talking about, you know, you're, you're literally are talking about, you know, apples and oranges here. But nonetheless... Uh, the Treaty of 1763 ends the, the French and Indian War. Here's some of the details. Well, number one, France, you're the big loser. All right, you're the biggest loser in this whole game. So you're going to get, you're going to lose almost everything. Uh, for example, New France, anything west, uh, east, sorry, France, New France is going to go to Britain. All right, so anything that's east of the Mississippi River, it's going to go to Britain. Uh, so all the good spots, you know, they're going, you know, so the, so for basically from the Mississippi River all the way to the East Coast, that's going to all be French territory. The exception, of course, is going to be New Orleans. New Orleans is actually going to be given to the Spanish. Spanish is going to get, is going to give, sorry, Spain is going to give the Great Britain, uh, sorry, going to give Florida to Great Britain. Uh, and, like I said, then they gain New Orleans. And, in fact, if you were to go to the French Quarter, for example, in New Orleans today, and you walk around the streets, you'll see the, the French Quarter signs uh, with their French name, but you'll also see in tiles, you know, during the Spanish occupation, this used to be named Calle de Blanc, you know, Calle de Bourbon, and stuff like that. But, nonetheless, New Orleans goes to Spain. Great Britain, it returns Manila and Havana to Spain, and also any other overseas in Spanish and French uh, colonies, but they get a massive chunk. They they practically take over the entirety of the of North America, the good parts. If you look at it, Spain still has the lion's share of the land, but uh, in terms of quality of land, you know, we're talking about quality here, not. Quality.